Okay, so if you're anything like me, you probably have a whole load of things you want to get done. Whether they're skills you want to develop or projects you want to pursue. But if you've got a 9 to 5 job and other commitments, it's kind of easy to get through the day and have no energy for anything else. So in this video, we're going to talk about the practices and principles I use to stay energized pretty much every day. And we're going to start with focusing on small wins. So there are studies to suggest that having side hustles and hobbies can actually improve your performance in your regular 9 to 5 by leaving you psychologically empowered or otherwise kind of energized rather than just more burned out. Because I'm sure we've all had days where doing more work or more deliberate practice after a difficult day just leaves us kind of unmotivated and even more exhausted. But there's a book I like called The Progress Principle which analyzed the diaries and habits of thousands of knowledge workers and found that the biggest single thing that can boost motivation and emotion during a work day is making progress on meaningful projects. And the more frequently people experience that sense of progress, the more likely they are to be creatively productive in the long run. Whether they're trying to make like a world changing scientific discovery or launch a small business or whatever. And so what this comes down to is getting small wins as frequently as possible. And so obviously one way to do this is to actually get a win. Maybe that's getting a bit of work published or finishing a piano piece or winning an award or tapping somebody out who's better than you in BJJ or whatever. But the thing is, some of those things are out of your control and sometimes they don't happen that often and they can even happen less frequently as you get better at whatever it is that you're doing, which is something that can lead to you getting really burned out. So I think a useful approach is to reframe winning as something that is within your control. So that might mean making your definition of a win smaller, but it might also mean calling a win just doing the things that you know you need to do. Like, I can't really control how long it takes me to learn a piano piece, but I can sit down at the piano every day and practice the parts of it that I'm finding it most difficult. Or I can't control how many people subscribe to my newsletter, link in the comments, but I can write one that's as useful and information-packed as I can every week. And that is a win for me. So if you make wins small and controllable, then you can go from having them every so often to quite regularly having four or five of them in a single day. And then you sort of go to bed at night going, yep, today was a good day. But there's another way of making work build up your energy rather than drain it, and that is to optimize for flow. So you're probably already kind of familiar with the idea of the flow state, where concentration feels really effortless and hours can pass in what feels like five minutes. And so obviously the more of your time you can spend in a flow state, the easier it is to stay energized while still getting a ton of stuff done. And people tend to associate the flow state with really high level sporting or musical performance, but there's an author called Stephen Kotler who's identified 22 triggers to flow. And there are a handful of them that you can apply to almost anything you do. So the first one is just working without distraction. And for instance, studies on coders show that it can take them 15 minutes to get back into a flow state if their concentration's broken. So when I'm trying to get into a flow state, the first thing I do is make sure all my notifications are switched off and that everybody I'm working with knows that I'm gonna be unavailable for like 25 minutes or whatever the period of time is that I need to do uninterrupted good work. The second one is to have clear goals, which I think is an easy one to do at work by just starting every project by kind of repeating what you understand the goals of the project to be back to whoever's set it, just so you know that you're on the same page about what it is that you're doing. And then with hobbies like piano or BJJ, it's about sitting down before a practice session and being really clear about what you're trying to accomplish in that session. And that might be like hit this specific move or learn this one specific passage. And then the third flow trigger is to keep a good challenge to skill ratio in whatever you're doing. So that means seeking activities that align with your current skill level while offering you like a slight stretch in difficulty. And you are going to have to manage how to stay in that Goldilocks zone of difficulty over time. But I think one of the best ways to do that is keep it playful. So pretty much everyone's heard of deliberate practice, or the idea that getting better means working right at the edge of your comfort zone and studying at pretty near full concentration constantly. I've done that quite a lot, and honestly, it's kind of a grind and it's pretty difficult to sustain. But the thing is, there's also a lot of evidence that using unstructured play rather than endless drilling and repetition can actually make you better in quite a lot of different spheres. So a classic example of this might be doing cone drills for soccer. Plenty of great players have used them to improve their footwork, but they are kind of tedious. And in contrast, some of the best players in history have used small scale, less organized games to get dozens of touches on the ball and practice in a slightly scaled down manner. And so this is something I do in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. 
So for instance, instead of just endlessly drilling movement, at our academy we work on a lot of mini games where you get a chance to compete against each other in a scaled back way that lets you get like a ton of live practice in certain situations. And keeping it playful is super important when it comes to physical skills, which brings me to the next bit of advice, which is to do punch the clock workouts. So there's a ton of evidence that working out in the right way will give you more energy rather than tiring you out. Exercise stimulates the production of mitochondria and improves oxygen circulation, and obviously it produces endorphins, which are sort of natural mood boosters that can reduce stress and enhance your energy levels over the short and long term. But obviously not all workouts are created equal, and so when I'm having a stressful time with work or other projects, then I don't put myself through the kind of grinding, really difficult workouts I might focus on at other times. A bit of advice that I really like from a strength coach called Dan John is that about one in every five workouts will be great, one will be terrible and three will be what he calls punch the clock workouts where you just go to the gym, get it done and leave, hopefully feeling a bit better. So the way I do this is to keep my workouts short, regular and simple. So for instance, I might do a couple of supersets, then like a quick 500 meter row or ski erg to get my endorphins flowing and put me in a good state for the rest of the day. Or if I'm not in the mood to hit the gym, I might just do some mobility work, press ups and kettlebell swings at home. I'm not necessarily trying to chisel myself into amazing shape with these, I'm just putting in a little bit of work, getting myself moving and energizing myself for the rest of the day. I'm also just getting out of my chair because another benefit of exercise is that it changes your surroundings a bit which can kind of give you a mental refresh. And exercise also has the benefit of helping you sleep which is handy because my next bit of advice is to keep sleep simple. So these days it's become really fashionable to have kind of an elaborate bedtime routine that starts almost at the moment you wake up. But honestly, I think that the less you worry about sleep, the easier it is to have a sleep routine you can replicate anywhere, which helps you get to sleep when you're on the road, staying at people's houses or in a plane or whatever. I try and get a minimum of seven hours of sleep every night. And for me, good sleep comes down to three different things. Sunlight exposure, caffeine, and breathing. So the research suggesting that blue light can affect sleep at night is actually pretty bad. The study that most people cite does show that it suppresses melatonin, but even when people looked at an e-reader for four hours before bed, they only actually went to sleep about 10 minutes later. So I don't really worry about blue light at all, but I do worry about sunlight, which there's good research to suggest can keep your biological clock like online, especially if you get it fairly early in the morning. And the second thing I would suggest is to stop drinking caffeine after about 3 p.m., but you probably already know you should do that. And then the third thing I would suggest is to have some kind of deep breathing to help you get off to sleep. Personally, I'm a big fan of what's known as box breathing, where you breathe in for seven seconds, hold for seven, breathe out for seven, and then hold again for seven. But basically almost any kind of regulated breathing is gonna do the same thing as box breathing does, which is to bring your parasympathetic nervous system online and sort of give you something to focus and be mindful on to help you drift off to sleep. If you wanna get more involved, I've also had great results with progressive muscle relaxation, where you sort of deliberately tense and then relax all the muscles in your body, starting on your shoulders and then working your way down. But to be honest, 80% of the time, just deep breathing is enough to put me off to sleep in a few minutes. So I'd really just suggest keeping it simple. And another place I would suggest keeping it simple is with drinking more water. And I'm gonna be honest, this is something I occasionally forget about. Sometimes I'll get to like three o'clock in the afternoon and I'll be like, why am I flagging so badly? And the answer is usually, I haven't drunk enough water today. So what I do when I'm consciously trying to stay energized is I'll keep a big bottle of water on my desk fill it up with like two liters at the start of the day, and then I will automatically drink basically all of it by about 5 p.m. And that really helps. I honestly don't think hydration needs to be that complicated. And that gives me more time to worry about the final thing, which is having loads to do. So there's an old saying that goes, if you wanna get something done, give it to a busy person. And that sounds kind of paradoxical, but I actually think that having a ton of different projects to do can help you be more productive by letting you sort of jump between them as the moods take you, so that you never get completely burned out on one of them. In a book called The Organized Mind, Daniel Levitin points out that even inveterate procrastinators benefit from having more to do. They'll dive into a task that is more appealing than the one they're trying to avoid, 
and make great progress on a huge number of projects. So for me, the way this works is that I can always have a bunch of different projects I'm doing. That might mean writing newsletters, editing videos, coming up with ideas, or just like watching and reading things that might spark something off that's interesting in my brain. But there are a couple of things I use to not get tired when I'm doing these. Firstly, I use what I think of as the Hemingway trick, which means stopping when I feel energized rather than pushing on through until I start to feel bored. So this comes from the idea that Ernest Hemingway would quite often stop his writing sessions in the middle of like a paragraph or even a sentence where he knew exactly what was going to happen to his characters next. So if I'm writing, I might stop when I know what I'm going to write next. Or if I'm reading, I might stop when I really want to know what happens next instead of forcing myself to get through a set number of pages until I'm sick of whatever book I'm reading. And secondly, I have everything written down which means that I can pick up any one of these projects whenever I want to do it, instead of trying to juggle the spot I'm at in them all in my head. I think a final good idea that comes from the study that I mentioned at the top of the video is that you should have at least some projects that feel completely different to what you do in the working day, because there's pretty good evidence that having stuff to do that isn't similar to your work life is what energizes you the most, which is why I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and piano. But energy isn't the only thing you need. You actually also need to be able to fit all this stuff into your workday in the first place. And for the system I used to do that, you can check out the video I've done on it right here. I will see you over there.